this is the talk you were here to see. If this is not the talk you were here to see, you're in the wrong room. Um, Hi, I'm Noah. Uh, I'm mostly active in the Chef and DevOps communities. Uh, I'm known as Cantrin on Twitter and Code Ranger basically everywhere else. Um, I work for Bloomberg primarily as an open source liaison to the Chef world. Um, and thanks Bloomberg for sponsoring this conference. That's not why I'm talking here, but they're cool. All right, so let's lead off. Uh, this talk is about secrets as they pertain to infrastructure. If you're looking for advice about browser extensions and storing passwords in your laptop, or web development and storing passwords in your Django app, uh, that's not what this talk is about. If you press me, I would recommend 1Password and PBKDF2, respectively, but talk's not about that. If you want to leave, no hard feelings. So what defines a secret in terms of infrastructure? You could treat all private information in infrastructure, like all user data, as secret, but that quickly becomes unwieldy. So to keep us focused, I'm going to use these three properties. First, secrets have to be small. You might use techniques like database encryption or disk encryption to use a small secret to control access to a much larger piece of information, but the secret part itself is relatively small. Second, secrets are radioactive. It means that something bad would happen if an attacker knew a secret. So compare a username and a password. If an attacker knows your username, not really a big deal. If they know your password, a very big deal. So the username is not secret, the password is secret. And finally, they're generally required. Modern infrastructure full of microservices, et cetera, et cetera, we have this concept of graceful degradation as your infrastructure sort of falls over piece by piece. You want it to adapt and, and keep running as best it can. Secrets are usually immune from that. Uh, you, if your Django app doesn't have its database password, it can't do anything, sorry. Four types of secrets gonna use as guiding use cases. When we talk about passwords in this talk, again, we're talking about infrastructure, so we're talking server-to-server -server authentication, um, but when you're dealing with passwords, it's usually things that were designed first for humans. So for example, Postgres and MySQL. There's a username and password pair there because they were originally designed for people to log into a database. Now we generally have applications logging into a database, but we've kept the same format as before. Passwords are usually gonna be relatively small, under about 1K, and they're one word, more or less. Like, they don't have internal structure. Other examples of passwords, HTTP proxy passwords or Linux login passwords. Tokens are similar to passwords, but whereas uh, passwords are for things that were originally designed for human to server authentication, tokens are for things designed from the ground up for server to server communication. Also, unlike passwords, you can't cheat and hash them. With a password, you could store the hash and use that directly. With a, with a token, it usually needs to be in its raw form to be usable. So some examples are AP, API credentials for things like PagerDuty or OAuth access tokens. And then keys are gonna be a whole lot bigger than passwords and tokens, uh, and they're, they have internal structure. They have new lines, they have that dash, 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 RSA private key header, whatever it is, but they have some internal structure to them. So TLS keys, SSH keys, that kind of thing. And then this long tail of miscellaneous other. Some of these are close enough to one of the main three to make it work. So for instance, Kerberos machine tickets look an awful lot like key files, just with some specialized admin commands like kadmin and whatnot. Other ones like PCI log files or HIPAA records, you're gonna need dedicated tools. Nothing I'm talking about today will help you with those, sorry. All right, so we know what types of secrets we're talking about. Let's take their temperature. Hot secrets or online secrets are things used during the normal operation of infrastructure. So these are things that a server needs to be able to get to the secret and be able to use it autonomously without human intervention. So if you had a Django or Flask app and every time a new web request came in, a human had to type in a database password at the console, web app's probably not gonna get a whole lot of work done. So that's an example of an online or hot secret. To compare, cold secrets are things that we want to store and keep safe long term, but we don't really need them day to day. So for example, AWS master passwords or re uh, revocation certificates, those are things that you want to keep very safe, but it's okay if a, uh, a server can't access it automatically without human intervention. The hot versus cold dichotomy is rarely 100% clear in practice. Most tool secrets techniques are gonna fall somewhere in the middle, like a small application cluster might require human intervention to boot a new server, which is coldish, but once the server is running, it has to be completely autonomous, which is more hottish. And then within online or hot secrets, there's another subspectrum around how often it changes. So most traditional online secrets management systems are built around slow secrets. Once set, a secret generally only changes in response to an emergency, like a compromise or an attack, or to comply with industry standards like PCI DSS requiring you to rotate your encryption keys. Uh, rotating a slow secret is a human-initiated action, and it's usually a fairly large amount of work, something that you wouldn't want to do often. Biggest example is TLS keys. We all know they've changed. How many people have accidentally let a TLS certificate expire? Uh, but when we're thinking about them day to day, we think of them as being relatively static data because they only change every year or two or three. 
To compare that, some newer platforms have this idea of automatic rotation. So it means that the system will regenerate and redistribute updated data in hours or minutes instead of days, weeks, months, years. So for instance, OCSP stapling is effectively regenerating a TLS certificate every 15 minutes, or Amazon EC2 role credentials, which reset themselves every six hours. Within reason, the more often a secret is rotated, the more secure you are. If there was an unknown breach or if somebody is trying to brute force something, uh, every time you rotate it, you effectively reset the clock. Uh, it does, however, require more explicit coordination between the thing consuming secrets and thing managing them, because the consumer needs to be aware of refresh timers and how to get access to the new data. All right, so that was properties of secrets. Let's talk about properties of secrets management systems. The principle of least access, at least as it pertains to computer science, is generally attributed to Jerry Saltzer in this 1974 ACM paper. It's mostly common sense, but it's so often ignored that it bears strenuous repetition. In short, a service or tool should have access to the secrets it requires and nothing else. Quality of every secrets management platform is going to be judged on these two main principles, principle of least privilege or principle of least access, and how much of an audit trail it records. So when something goes wrong, and it will, you can figure out what happened, where, when, and why. Other features are important, and we're gonna talk about lots of them, but these two things should always lead off, uh, and you'll figure out the secondary features later. All right, let's do it. Let's manage some secrets. Bam, done. We can all go home, right? All right, we've all done this. We knew it was a bad idea, uh, but maybe not why it was a bad idea. So let's talk about it. Uh, <laughs> we have the secret now hanging out in plain text in everything that clones our Git repository. This means that we have, con we have conflated the access privileges of can clone source code with can access database password. There's a really good chance that you don't actually want those two things to be linked together. For example, your staging machines probably shouldn't have access to your production database password. We've also got no audit logging. At best, we can tell on the Git server who cloned the repository and when, but we don't have any idea who actually accessed the password and when they did it. All right, so we have a pretty good idea that we want to improve this, but how? So the next thing we need to figure out is what do we want to protect against? Threat modeling is this idea of figuring out what are the surfaces and places where there are especially vulnerable points in our armor, and what is the result of a successful compromise against those going to mean for our infrastructure security? I use these eight major levels, although you may want to ignore some of them. Each of these is an especially vulnerable point. We'll have to figure out how to protect it, figure out what it's going to mean if there's a successful attack. Again, I'm talking about infrastructure security. Web app security is a totally different talk. There's probably at least one at this conference, or if not, come talk to me afterwards. So brute force attacks, anything that is on the internet sees a nonstop parade of these and has for decades now. Fortunately, because it's been happening for decades, we have a lot of tools and techniques to get around these. I use the three R's, rate limit access, things like using a credential, so logins, API access, all that kind of stuff. Especially if it's a failed access, just rate limit those and you'll limit the ability of someone to brute force. Restrict access. If you've got a database server for your web app, don't put it on the internet. Use firewalls, use internal subnets, whatever it is. If it's not on the internet, it's a lot harder to brute force because somebody has to already get access into your network. And finally, rotate secrets. If it takes three weeks to brute force something and you rotate it every 15 minutes, well, good for them. You can also use techniques that are currently beyond brute forcing, like say 4096-bit RSA keys. However, be aware that's a moving target and data recorded or stolen now could potentially be cracked in the future. All right, weakest threat after that is code leaks. Taking aside the effects of the business, which might be considerable but aren't my problem right now, uh, this shouldn't be a big deal. We all know that we shouldn't hard code our passwords into our code files. Hopefully this is understood throughout everyone's code bases. So somebody have ac having access to the code shouldn't actually be a security impact. Superset of that is a backup leak. If you remember the Instagram hack a year or two ago, that was one of these. They took a full stack backup, including all of their config files that had live AWS credentials in them, put that backup up on S3 and promptly forgot about it. So it was on a, an S3 bucket with had, which had incorrect permissions and somebody got access to the backup and could use that to attack the rest of their infrastructure. The biggest thing here is to audit your backups. Look at what's in them, figure out what should be removed, uh, and then also make sure you continually update that list. You can also use things like storing data in environment variables, although I'll talk about that more in a second, which doesn't allow them to be backed up. Traversal attacks, as far as infrastructure goes, this is lumping together a whole bunch of different web application attacks together. Direct traversal, SQL injection, all that kind of stuff. The general structure is anything where the application has legitimate access to a secret, but the user doesn't. So for instance, a web app has legitimate access to a database password, it really does need that to operate, but the user isn't supposed to have access to that, hopefully. Uh, the best defense here is 
a combination of least privilege and good web app security. Again, I'm not talking about web app security, but that is what you want to do to protect things here. So if you use ORMs, you're usually immune to SQL injection, et cetera. As an aside, a frequent traversal style attack takes advantage of the, quote, best practice of storing things in environment variables. This is very popular because Heroku goes so far as to call this a best practice in the 12th, the 12th Factor Manifesto. I disagree. The biggest problem with this is there's a lot of foot guns involved with, uh, with environment variables. Um, things like, for example, they get snarfed up in all error loggers. So if you're running Sentry and there's an exception, somebody can usually figure out a way to trigger an exception on one of your production apps. It's not usually that hard. Uh, but it sucks up all the environment variables and ships them off in plain text to a log server somewhere, like a Sentry server or a syslog machine, whatever it is. Now they're chilling in plain text somewhere that you're not defending nearly as well. So beware with these. They also like automatically inherit all subprocesses. So let's say you run image magic as a subprocess to resize images or whatever, that they now have access to all of those. And as we saw recently, image magic did in fact have vulnerabilities that could have been exploited to access those environment variables. Here be dragons, I don't recommend this. All right. So now we've moved on from traversal to code execution. No amount of good web app security matters here because they are no longer running in the bounds of your web app. They can run their own Python code or shell code or C code, whatever it is, but they are running code as the user that is running the application. Here, a lot of what we need to use are things like file permissions, Linux containers, namespaces, that kind of thing. Uh, anything where the user of the application doesn't have access to whatever we want. So, uh, you've probably seen this a lot with things like uh, TLS keys, where the key is only readable as root. The application reads it at startup and then drops privileges. So if somebody breaks into Apache, they can't reread that uh, key file. It's not accessible in the file system. When Dante passes through the gates of hell, he notes the inscription, abandon all hope ye who enter here. When they get root privileges on the system, they get access to every secret on the system. I don't care what a Docker salesman has told you about Docker being able to isolate things with root privileges, it's not true. If you have root in a container, you have root on the machine, period. Uh, so here we fall back on least privilege. If the secret wasn't on the box, then it can't get access, that's it. We also wanna have good audit logs so that when this happens, we can see exactly what secrets were accessed so we know what to rotate. Another commonly ignored attack surface is laptop theft. If you're at a small company, access to a developer workstation usually gives root on every server. So what we saw on the last slide times your servers. Fortunately, uh, laptops are used by humans, not other servers, so they play by different rules. We can use things like disk encryption, and the user can have a passphrase that they never tell anyone else. Servers aren't allowed to do that. Everything has to exist on disk somewhere and could potentially be stolen, but your brain is still immune from that for now. And then finally, the higher power attack surface. This is where a lot of people draw the line on planning, either voluntarily or because industry regulations don't allow them to tell the FBI to smeg off. Things like uh, FISA court warrants, state-sponsored hacker groups, APTs, the list goes on and gets increasingly more difficult to handle. Here you'll have to ask yourself what you're going to do if one of these, is success, one of these types of attacks is successful, how much you want to protect your machines. Your response might just be, I don't know, I'm just going to go home and get a new job, but you should have it in mind. All right. Let's talk a little bit about cryptography terms. Uh, these are going to come up in a minute for a quick refresher for people who aren't familiar with uh, different types of cryptography. Symmetric crypto. So we're going to start with a secret of some kind, password, key, token, doesn't matter what it is. We're going to generate some kind of random key. We're going to use that key to encrypt the secret and make an encrypted blob. We're going to copy the key over to a server. We're going to copy the encrypted blog over to a server. Server uses the key to decrypt the blob and get back the original secret. So symmetric encryption because both sides need the same key, therefore symmetric. Asymmetric encryption works a little differently. You start with a secret, you generate a key pair on the target machine, you copy the public key, not the private key, up to your workstation, use the public key to encrypt the blob, copy the blob back over, use the private key to decrypt the secret. This is called asymmetric because the private key never goes to your workstation. It stays on the server forever, hopefully. Uh, and then this leads into the three main modes of secrets management, uh, symmetric pre-encryption, asymmetric pre-encryption, and trusted third party. So let's look at these in turn. Symmetric pre-encryption, as the name implies, uses symmetric encryption. So we generate a key, we encrypt a blob, we transfer the key to each of the servers. Notably, only two out of the three servers get the key. We put the encrypted blob up on some kind of storage medium, S3, internal Git, whatever it is. 
Everybody can download the encrypted blob. At that point, we don't really care about who has access to the encrypted blob because we assume it is opaque. Only the servers with the key can decrypt it. So the access control here is whoever has access to that symmetric key is the one that gets access to the secret. To compare this to asymmetric pre-encryption, fairly similar. We generate a key pair on each of them. We copy up, in this case, only two, but whatever. We copy up all the public keys. We get the public keys that we want, so in this case, just A and B. We generate separate encrypted copies, one for A and one for B. We put those back in the storage system. Again, internal Git, chef, server, whatever you have. Um, each server can download its own encrypted copy or someone else's encrypted copy, but that's opaque, so it can't use it. Each server can, however, decrypt their own encrypted copy. So again, the, the work here on access control is whoever we generate an encrypted copy for, they can use their key to decrypt the secret. So the access control work is done at the point when you generate the encrypted copy. This is a problem if you use things like auto-scaling because a new machine comes up, it can generate a key pair, but there's not gonna be an encrypted copy lying around for it. Make sense? All right, and then finally, trusted third party, which is how most of the more advanced systems work. In this case, we generate a secret. Everyone has API access credentials to the trusted third party web service of some kind. It's just kind of chilling there. It's running its own little REST API or what have you. We send a secret over to the trusted third party. A note that I'm not using encryption here. Usually you're gonna have things like disk encryption and TLS for transport encryption, but at its heart, a trusted third party needs access to the secret in the clear. So whatever fanciness, eventually the trusted third party system will have access to all of your secrets in the clear. But we attach a policy to it and we say only hand this secret to servers B and C and then only servers B and C get it. So this is a lot more uh, flexible because you can up do all of your policies in code, but remember that we're relying on the ACL code inside the trusted third party system. We are giving it access to all of our secrets. It's a giant silo of secrets and we're trusting its policy and access control mechanisms to limit access only to servers that we told it. Anytime you start looking at trusted third party systems, make sure you gut check your faith in its internal access controls. All right, so that's all the theory. Let's talk about actual tools. Starting from the top again, we've got manually moving text files around. We saw this before, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. This sometimes takes the form of putting secrets in the applications repo. Sometimes you'll end up with a Git repo called secrets, or sometimes you'll just have interns SCPing text files around. That one is usually how most people distribute TLS keys. But in any case, we already talked about why this is bad, so next. All right, a lot of people then want to say, I wanna store things and they should be encrypted because encryption makes me feel warm and fuzzy. So uh, there's a lot of tools that will encrypt your files in Git, but Gitcrypt is probably the best of them. And they all have the same downsides, so let's just talk about this one. Again, we have no real way to implement least privilege because we have to let everybody clone the code down. Uh, and it's an opt-in system, so it's very easy to forget to mark a file as encrypted and all of a sudden it's, de it's in the clear in your Git history and then you get to go look at that one stack overflow answer that everyone always has to go to when they want to expunge stuff from a Git repository. Real fun, don't do it. We, want to we don't want to store them in Git, so next thing we usually look for is, well, we have this key value storage lying around that we're using for like distributed cluster management stuff, console, Zookeeper, etcd, whatever it is. They all do have access control systems, so we can implement least access, and they generally have an access log, so we can implement audit logging of a sort. However, they're very difficult to use correctly. Console and etcd aren't so bad. Uh, Zookeeper's ACLs, I have literally never seen somebody implement them correctly as far as I can tell. So there's also tools that will layer encryption on top of these things using that, sort of like the way Gitcrypt does, but it doesn't really help the underlying problems of just being really finicky. So I don't really recommend this, but you can make it work. So I mentioned I'm active in the Chef world, so I see a lot of people saying I don't wanna use Git for storing them. Well, Chef has this encrypted data bags thing, and again, it says encryption, it makes me feel warm and fuzzy. Same problem. All right, so when we talked a little bit before about symmetric encryption systems, symmetric pre-encryption systems, you mentioned I said, and then we share the key with all of the servers that should have access. You will note that that key is itself a secret. So we haven't really solved secrets management so much as pushed down a level of recursion. That's why I say turtles all the way down. So if you want to do manual key distribution once, you can use tools like this to then move forward onto a nicer platform, but it doesn't actually help you solve it the first time. Ansible Vault is similar to Chef Encrypted Data Bags, but it takes advantage of Ansible's push-based nature, so the key, instead of having to be on all of the target systems, you only need the key on the developer workstation running the Ansible push. But same problem, how does that key get to that workstation? In most cases, well, I don't know, they copy and paste it out of an internal wiki? That's probably not a great idea. 
EAML is the closest analog to encrypted data bags in Ansible Vault, but for the Puppet world. Um, the key difference is that EAML and Puppet work using the trusted third party model. So instead of the key, instead of needing to do key distribution all the way to all the target machines or to the workstations, this is doing uh, encryption only up to the Puppet master. So it makes it a little bit more flexible, a little bit less hinky than the last two, but make sure you, you trust your faith in Puppet's access controls. Having said that, as far as I know, Puppet's access controls are fine and this is perfectly good to use. Back to a Chef specific tool, Chef Vault, no relation to Ansible Vault. Uh, this takes advantage of the fact that Chef uses RSA key pair authentication for its API to build the key distribution system for the symmetric keys for Chef encrypted data bags. You will note again that I said the word key again, so still Chef, uh, Chef client keys are their own secrets, except even with uh, people that are very familiar with Chef, they probably don't know how to rotate or manage those keys. So, uh, and again, it's an asymmetric pre-encryption system, so it's not compatible with any kind of auto-scaling or self-healing system. All right, so we're leaving the realm of single CM tools. HashCorp Vault, again, no relation to the others, just they keep using the same name. Relatively new in the secrets world, but it's making a lot of waves. It's a dedicated secrets management platform built from the ground up, unlike the previous things we've seen. So it supports all the features you would expect, things like uh, high quality audit trails, granular ACLs, and a best of breed auto rotation system for fast secrets. Slightly older but still solid is Square's KeyWiz. It has a more limited data model than uh, HashCorp Vault, but because of this, it's also a lot more battle tested. I'll talk about QSFS in a minute, but it excels at managing key type secrets as the name implies. You can use it for passwords or tokens, but the integration is gonna be a little bit more complex. For AWS, if you're full AWS all the time forever, one thing you can do is use the combination of private S3 buckets and IAM roles and just store stuff in private S3 buckets. This is my personal recommendation as the simplest of all the options we're gonna talk about here today, but it does require that you are perma AWS all the time forever. Related, Amazon KMS is not itself a secrets management tool, but it'll be linked into some of the next ones I talk to. It's a key escrow system instead. So whenever I talked about to generate a random key and use that to encrypt something, you would instead create the key inside Amazon KMS. KMS doesn't give you access to the key, but you can send data to it to be encrypted or decrypted, and it uses the IAM permission system to control access to keys. Uh, in general, it does also require buying into AWS for everything. So again, everything that I talk about related to KMS, assume that you are drinking the Amazon Kool-Aid. All right, so Sneaker is a tool that builds on KMS to build a more complete secrets management platform. It uses S3 for the backing storage, um, and it's a command line tool. So instead of having an API, you have, to, you have to actually run a push and pull from your workstation or from the server. Confidant, as opposed to that, it, it uses DynamoDB as the backing store, and it has a REST API, so it's a little bit easier to integrate with. Um, it's also got a nice web interface, and it's got a nice versioning system for showing the, the history of when secrets changed and who changed them. Uh, back to command line tools, Trousseau is an asymmetric pre-encryption system, uh, similar to Sneaker, except instead of using KMS, it uses GPG. We'll see uh, another one that uses GPG. Keep in mind, GPG is by neckbeards for neckbeards. Uh, I say this as the bearer of said neckbeard. Um, it means that you can do large scale automated key management using GPG, but expect to hit a couple of speed bumps. It's not really built for it. It's usually a, a single human interaction tool. So you're probably gonna spend a lot of time on Stack Overflow if you go this route. SOPS from Mozilla uh, combines the properties of the last few ones. It doesn't actually do storage, so you have to do that yourself, but it does allow uh, KMS or GPG or both. So if you're running a hybrid infrastructure on like your own machines and Amazon, this could potentially be interesting for you. Red October is a very different beast. Instead of being optimized for online or hot secrets, this one is built for cold. So we talked about that way at the beginning. Um, if you remember back from the old nuclear missile launch movies, you have to turn two keys at once to launch the missile. It's kind of like that, except you can define both the, the number of keys that exist and the number that are required. It's called an N of M key split. So you could say something like, this secret requires three of five key holders to cooperate, or five of five, or whatever structure you want it to be. Um, you can do that. So for things that are really, really high value, it can be useful to keep them in this. Um, you can also use it as an online secrets management platform if you really want. You would just say, this key is one of five, or one of one, or whatever it is. Um, but that's not really the point. Presented for completeness, Barbican was originally intended to be the OpenStack equivalent to Amazon KMS, but the project is unfortunately dead at this point. Um, I mentioned Conjure specifically because it's the one I see the most, but there's a whole bunch here, um, CyberArk, et cetera. They're all proprietary closed source key management systems. In general, if somebody sends you a security guarantee on closed source code, 
I wouldn't necessarily trust it. Um, you know, it, it's how much you trust the vendor. I usually don't like using closed source key management and secrets management tools. And then finally, the biggest gun. So HSMs, or their baby brother TPMs, are ways of storing a key in hardware in a way that the key cannot be extracted without uh, dissolving the chip in acid and reading it out with an electron microscope. Uh, TPMs are on most modern server motherboards, so if you're running your own hardware, you probably already have them. Um, HSMs, on the other hand, are phenomenally expensive. Um, Amazon will rent you a, quote, cloud HSM for only $16,000 a month. Um, HSMs are, however, almost unbreakable if implemented properly. Bugs are not unheard of in the firmware, which can allow security exploits, but most of them are pretty good. There's a wide variety. They're hugely varying. If you expect to go this route, uh, you're going to spend a lot of money on consultants. All right. Through all of this, we keep dancing around a really hard problem of secrets management. Deep down, any secrets management system needs to uh, establish a relationship between the thing requesting secrets and the thing managing them. In the parlance, this is called secure introduction. It turns out that bootstrapping an identity relationship is really hard. With most of these tools and systems, it, it boils down to, I am going to SCP some kind of token file, and whoever picks up on the other side of that SSH connection, they are now whoever that identity is. If somebody intercepted that initial SSH, eh, probably not good. Um, some clouds do offer better identity management mechanisms. So for instance, Amazon has the instance identity document. Uh, Google Cloud has uh, the cloud signature system. And Azure has the Azure Key Vault. All of those provide much stronger concepts of identity. Um, but if you're not running on one of those, like if you're on OpenStack or VMware or your own hardware, you're out of luck. Um, you may just have to figure out what you are willing to trust and then move forward and build nice things on top of that baseline of trust. As a correlator to this, if you take it as a given that you need to build this strong concept of server identity, uh, you can just skip the secret part altogether. A lot of things like MySQL and Postgres, they support TLS client certificates for authentication. So you don't actually ever need a secret. Public keys do need to be handled carefully, but they're not radioactive in the same way that a password is. All right, so let's talk about integration, how to actually make this work with your code. So, for things with their own service or API, the most direct approach is to use a REST client. So for instance, HashCorp Vault has the HVAC library. Um, KMS has Bodocore, also for all the other Amazon services, but includes KMS. And some of them even come with built-in web framework integration. So for example, using HVAC, so this is an example of a Django settings.py. Um, here we can just, in our settings.py, instantiate an HVAC client and get a password out and set it in the database's hash. Super simple, you know, this works really well if you control the code, so if it's your own application, you can do this. If not, you're probably gonna wanna script this through your existing config management, Chef, Puppet, Salt, Ansible, all of those. Um, this also works best with things that are command line tools instead of APIs, because most of these things can run a command on the target machines for you. So for example, with Chef, you could use Sneaker to download stuff, um, or you could use the, the, my Citadel library, which is a little S3 client for doing the private S3 pattern in your, your CM tool. Uh, KeyWizFS is a very relatively unique, I guess, feature of KeyWiz. Um, it's a Fuse file system driver that acts as a REST client for the KeyWiz API. This is great for things where you don't want to modify the program at all. So for example, Nginx. You don't want to go and hack on Nginx's code and compile your own, et cetera. You just want to tell it, load your uh, TLS private key and certificate from this file on like slash KeyWiz slash Nginx slash key.pem. Um, and it's going to read directly out of the QWIZ API. It's never going to be buffered to disk, all those kinds of nice things. It's super easy to do when you don't want to modify things. You just give them paths to files. Console templates was originally designed for the console server discovery system, which is cool, but not this talk. But it has been extended to support HashCorp Vault as well. Uh, this is similar to the examples I showed using your config management system to write out a template file using some data from your secrets management tool. But this can be nice like if you're using something like Ansible or if you're using Chef Puppet or Salt, but you want to run them on a low frequency. Um, if you want fast rotating secrets, so if you want your database password to roll every hour, but you only run Ansible every day, then you're going to want something that sort of sits as a shim between them. So you'd have Ansible deploy console templates, and console templates just sits there and updates the template every time the uh, database password changes. Env console is similar to console templates, except instead of writing out template files, it writes things into environment variables. I've already talked about why I don't think this is a good idea, but if you've got like a one-off integration, it's there. And summon is similar to env console, except it has pluggable backends for things other than HashCorp Vault, so things like S3 or local keyring services. All right, so to summarize, whenever you're dealing with secrets management, check your privilege in your audit trail, pick your types and temperatures of secrets, Think about your attack surfaces and have a disaster plan for when everything goes wrong. Thank you very much. Any questions?
All the slides are already up on my website, codeenginer.net. Click on the speaking link. All right, we've got uh, about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, just wanna... We got mics. Cool. Uh, hi. You mentioned in passing that if you get root on a Docker image, you can get root on the containing. Uh, yes. Could you expand on that a little bit? Uh, the exact methods change from day to day in Docker release to Docker release, but you should always assume. So because Docker is taking the entire kernel interface and then selectively blacklisting portions of it, that's how the, the underlying namespace and C group systems work. They can't get everything, and if there's an exploit in any kernel interface, the entire kernel was written with the assumption if you are UID zero, you are God. Um, and it turns out it's really hard to undo that when you've got decades of code written assuming that. It's in all kinds of weird places. They're trying, but it is functionally impossible to do that in a way that I would trust. Great talk. Very good summary. Amazing, actually. It's really tough to track down that list. Uh, people like to hide their security stuff, so I appreciate it a lot. Um, can you expand on uh, basically having authenticated systems running within a, um, a pull base? So it's interesting, you work on Chef and so forth, right? And individual machines sort of have to be manually provisioned, but now mm -hmm. with containers and Mesos and so forth, when you have pulling going on dynamically, right? How are you supposed to do that securely? So it's hard. So the problem goes back to that secure introduction thing I mentioned of you need an identity structure for the thing that is doing the pull. And the usual way you get that is to push its identity into it when it's created. This can be somewhat ameliorated because most of the provisioning systems are still push-based. So something has to say, create a new Docker container. It gets a little fuzzy because that thing might be like Mesos and it's, it's, you know, it's auto scaling the Docker containers, but somebody pushed into Mesos at some point to say create a new app cluster, whatever it is. Like there is a push at some point and you can chain the introduction all the way down. Or you can use things that are just built in. So like Docker now has, inside Docker Swarm, it has an internal concept of, of authentication and identity within the container. It's not easy to leverage those across systems though. So like it's very difficult to take Docker's concept of identity and just use it with like MySQL. So you need to write these little bridging shims that understands and trusts Docker and can translate that into like HashCorp Vault or something. Um, and some of those exist, some of them don't. Quick follow up, what happens if you don't do that? I just want on the record. I mean, so the usual solution is I'm just going to like make an environment variable in my Docker container, and I'll do like Docker run dash e and give it a token like a token for for that app, and the identity is linked to the application instead of the container, so you can no longer tell which actual container accessed a thing. Mm, one of them, like there was an IP address that maybe you logged, but it's an ephemeral IP because the container is already gone. You might know what hypervisor it was in, so things just get the the, the less granular your concept of identity, the more fuzzy your logs get because they have to. Hi. I understood the slides where you said it's turtles all the ways down, mm -hmm. but I didn't understand how we got from that to some of these systems aren't turtles all the way down. So with uh, symmetric pre-encryption systems, I say it's turtles all the way down because that symmetric key is itself a secret. So you have to deal with distributing that key before you can do anything else. With the asymmetric pre-encryption systems, it doesn't necessarily have to be because every server, even like a pull-based system, is generating its own key pair and then registering it with a central authority of some kind. There's sometimes a problem where you have to figure out how do I authenticate who is registering, but sometimes you can just ignore that. Um, or the trusted third party thing where there's no symmetric key anywhere in the system. Everyone just, again, has to authenticate into the trusted third party. But once you figure out how to do that, then everything is fine. There's, no, there's never this like, symmetric key that you have to sync to all of the machines. Any other questions? Hey, uh, this was a fun overview of, uh, I don't know, just a whole bunch of stuff to fill in some gaps for me. So thank you. 
Uh, one technique you mentioned was the idea of using uh, like a private S3 bucket and then using Amazon's identity access management to control access to that. Uh, and that's a technique that I've used in the past uh, at employers that I worked at. And I was just wondering if you've ever seen IAM fail you. Like, is, is that really something that I can, I can trust all the way? So two answers. One, no, I've never seen IAM fail. It's always been me miswriting a policy because you end up with these like 4,000 line JSON documents that are just incomprehensible to humans. But there's a second answer, which is uh, if you are under almost any of the major industry regulations, SOX, PCI, HIPAA, I, mean, I, think, I think HIPAA now, um, Amazon has certificates for all of those. They have certifications. So if there is a problem with IAM, it's not your fault legally and you can't be sued under those industry regulations. And that's honestly a lot of what security is about these days is limiting liability. If somebody really wants to hack you, they're probably going to be able to. Like if you're the target of the Russian government or the North Koreans, I'm real sorry, it's probably gonna work. Um, but it can at least not be legally your fault. So that's nice. <laughs> the Authentication with the trusted third party, uh, how do you do that without exposing secrets as well? Is any part of that secret? Very carefully. Um, this is where I mentioned that some of the clouds have better mechanisms. So HashCorp Vault, as of the, I think the latest version or maybe the version one ago, can use Amazon, the instance identity document directly for authentication. So the instance identity document is this like signed blob of some of the EC2 instance metadata, the name, the instance ID, the IP address, all that kind of stuff, um, with a signature from Amazon that can be verified. So the instance can pull its instance identity document and then hand it to Vault. Vault can verify that the signature is valid based on Amazon's posted public keys and then say, okay, then I'm going to use this name to look up your policy inside Vault, basically. It's a little more complicated than that, but you get a real concept of identity within Amazon. If you're running your own hardware, maybe you'd use TPMs, or maybe you would just do the terrible thing the first time. You'd manually sync over a token when the machine boots and then let it sit there forever. And just really, really hope that no one intercepted that first SSH connection. All right, if there's no other questions, thank you very much. Um, just a general.